we've all had conversations where we've come into the conversation one way and something about the dialogue, right? Maybe it was super personal, maybe it was philosophical, but there's something about the meeting such that you walked away and you were different somehow. Circling, you could say, is a yoga of those kinds of conversations. It's about whatever those asanas, those postures and communication, it's fundamentally stretching, strengthening that muscle that is both available and generative of those kinds of unexpected life-changing conversations. So basically, we've been on an inquiry in Rebel Wisdom since starting the channel about a, a year and a half ago, trying to sort of see where the emergent conversation is mm -hmm. and found some really, really fascinating thinkers in that time and had some really interesting conversations. Why I'm really excited about this is that so circling is a practice that's becoming more popular and a lot more people seem to be aware of it. And I guess it's possibly hard to describe exactly what it is without, without doing it, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best now. And I'd say it's a way of making a conversation self-aware. And it's a, it's a form of trying to be alive to what wants to emerge in the moment and often naming the dynamics that are present in the relationship that allows a deeper level of presence and communication to be there in the relationship. And there are other, as I'm sure we'll talk about, there are other different modalities for doing that. But why I think it's so crucial right now is that a lot of people in our channel have talked about the need for a collective intelligence as this almost next evolutionary step. And I think these kind of, they're often called we space technologies. I'm not sure I like that, that term very much. No, you're shaking your head as well. So, <laughs> but, but there's certainly, I mean, there are no, in a way, there's no really good language for this kind of intersubjective sense making is another mouthful. It's like, but I think these are hugely crucial practices that I think are, are evolutionary, evolutionarily important. So I'm really interested in this conversation and what, what comes out of the dialogue. So mm -hmm. I'd love if you could just briefly say, where circling came from and 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 how would you summarize it so i want to say i've really appreciated your channel and what you're doing on multiple levels um one is just just the fact that you're listening for the emergent conversation just just the fact that that's what you're doing is in itself impressive to me um and also watching how the people that you're dialoguing with are in some way co-shaping your channel and watching the channel evolve and in such a way where it almost feels that the very thing that you have your eye on um, is, is, making, is making what's emerging a kind of a self-awareness. So it's almost like rebel will, wisdom in a certain sense is this way in which that which is emerging in the culture is uh, saying I to itself and asking itself questions and stuff. So I've just appreciated uh, the multi dimensions of what kind of comes through in all the things that you're doing. And I really appreciate it a lot. Hmm. Thank you. And I would say that uh, circling for me has been very much the same thing. It, it's more like it's, it's, it wasn't anything that, that anyone had any idea of trying to create something, right? It wasn't, it was, it happened spontaneously in a moment. Um, it was a moment of, of what you could call this deep connection with a group of friends of ours. However, stood out from all other moments of deep connections with groups of friends of mine um, in that the, it's the depth of the conversation and the connection um, was a kind of end in itself. Like the value of the connection was its own end in a way. It's what shined forth. And so in a certain sense, and it was a, you know, a, a probably a month later when it finally actually somebody called, like named it circling, which I've been trying to understand even why it's called that, right, ever since. Um, what stood out was this, uh, what I would imagine you've re referred to before as like a we space or an intersubjective um, space that's distinct. Um, 
And so circling has been telling me what it is ever since the beginning. And it's, I feel like my job has been to listen deeply to it um, and distinguish it from also what it isn't. Um, so it's, I would say that circling, one way of saying it is it's a, it's a deep inner subjective relational yoga or meditation, right? Just like with yoga, there are all these asanas that develop capacities of mind and body um, that, that are basically extremes of, or archetypes of positions that you have psychically and, and physically in the world. Circling is, you could say, is a set of asanas in which people get together and they do these deep stretches of all the things that it takes to be intimate with somebody, to, to deeply listen to someone, to like share the truth of your own experience, to move into conflict without going to war, right? All of those, all of those capacities, we, we do these deep asanas so that when you're walking around in the world and you're not necessarily thinking about whether or not you're doing circling, when you talk to your mom, you can enter into that conversation even on her own terms in a way that's more brings more aliveness and more truth and more closeness and authenticity. Mm. Yeah. I want to pick up on, so we, are you familiar with inquiry the, as a modality? As uh, I I'm familiar with it as parts of modalities like all like diamond heart, Exactly. It's the Almas work. So the Ridwan school or the Almas essence work, yes. which is, which was the main influence on the counseling training that, that I've, I've been learning yes. and inquiry. So we actually on our retreats, get the guys into a space of inquiry and the way that we frame it is as a kind of talking meditation. Hmm. The, yeah. It's really great. Being alive to what's, what's happening at the moment as we're talking and there's a word that that I think is very powerful in this space and that's curiosity mm. Mm. this sense of being curious because implicit in that word is one there's a there's a there's a not knowing there's a sense of of we're not in a fixed position and that sort of opening up to curiosity and then in a recent film we just put out uh, called the science and psychology of polarization we, we spoke with Stephen Porges, who came up with polyvagal theory and with Peter Levine, who came up with somatic experiencing. And Stephen Porges, why I think he's a very interesting thinker is that he, with polyvagal theory, came up with the, the sort of scientific background of why curiosity is so important. Mm. Because curiosity and defensiveness cannot exist at the same time, that our physiology is wired towards either expansion curiosity the possibility of something new or defensiveness just being in a space of knowing of, of saying what we know yes uh, as, as you're saying that i'm, I'm re reminded of uh what maximus the confessor seven i think he was uh, lived in like the 1700s um he said he described like you could say the ground of consciousness the ontological ground of consciousness as as he would put it, as an existential ontological astonishment at the givenness of being, right? That kind of, that fundamental sense of, of where, it, where I, it seems to me that what we tap into in these modalities like inquiry or circling is it's not just something that we do like an act, like I'm someone that then acts and is then curious. There's a way in which curiosity could be a, a, a way of distancing. Mm. But when one finds oneself interested in something, right, like deeply struck by something, it, to me, there's something so primordial to that. Um, it, it seems like so primordial to the fact of awareness itself is mm. that part of awareness is it's always aware of the world. It's coupled with the world. And so there's a way in which, um, like what you're talking about, when one is, feels safe, when one feels um, deeply considered, one can relax into the ground of being. And what is just there, in my experience, is something like curiosity or interest. Mm. So it's those, those two things between, I've noticed safety, right? 
um, safety and curiosity seem to be go hand in hand. When there's danger, when the, well, like the relationship breaks down and that other part of your nervous system gets spread up, I notice curiosity is the last thing that goes. Mm. I, you know, the, I'm, I'm curious as hell about you until you don't give me what I want or you piss me off, right? Yeah. Then, I, then I know exactly who you are. So those two things between openness, safety, and interest and curiosity seem to go hand in hand to me in ways that are, I think, are really quite mysterious and deep. Mm. Yeah, are you are you familiar with polyvagal theory and the Stephen Porges work? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, I'm familiar with it for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I loved how he talked about the the neurophysiology of spirituality or religion. That if there was a there's a synthesis even in that perspective that 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 underpins a sort of philosophical view and right. and in some ways a religious view of the world. Yes. Yeah, we're, these these places, and what, this is what's really interesting. What I'm watching on your channel are lots of people making these biological connections to all these other dimensions of human experience. And there's something about when all those line up that kind of shines forth in a way that seems super necessary for in today's society and culture for it to actually grab hold and for people to trust it. Hmm. Yeah, so those 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 deep biological links are, uh, and especially the connectedness to embodiment, right? So that there's a, a some kind of there's some kind of logos even to my nervous system. Yeah, I mean the word that is coming up when you're speaking is, and you said connectedness, and that's is synthesis. There's this sort of deep need for synthesis mm. that's being called out right now. Mm. And there's, there's an intellectual synthesis. There's a sense of the sort of having lost the deep mythos that something is, something desperately needs to be born in that space, mm. or we're really feeling the absence of that. But then there's the, the, the there's a risk of that being disconnected from the body of that not being embodied and the of that only being yeah only being an intellectual synthesis is sort of is lacking that's not going to touch the sides i think what we're needing right now is a much deeper synthesis than that yes and i think a lot of the but in some sense it it, it also can't really be named that there's a sense of a lot of people on our channel talking about something or almost in code, but in a way that you can't really name it precisely. You can kind of name the outlines of it. Mm. You can name what it isn't, but you can't name the emergent mm -hmm. thing that is what we're, we're all in some sense aware of and trying to um, stay alive to. And I, I, I really liked just to, I was just listening to your conversation with John Bavaki. You, you mentioned something about circling is, about what is most alive. Yes. And he, let, he then linked that to evolution. That was almost an evolutionary process. There's almost like a, a natural, yes. um, there's a natural imperative to be on that edge where everything is most alive. Yes, and at the end, it's like at the end of that conversation was really, in fact, I would say that interview is a very, in, in a certain way, is, a, is an example of what I would call circling, right? That, because there is this way where his ideas and what was so true for him personally um, really kind of came, they synthesized and came together, especially at the end. And that there's something about those things coming together that w you could watch both of our hearts just open with each other, hmm. where it wasn't just some personal growth epiphany, right? Or insight about oneself. It was actually a, a recognition of that, uh, of two things coming together, um, but recognizing it as they come together. Uh, that's what was so beautiful for me. And what I see often over and over and over and over again in circling. And I think it's one of the, why, what you're, the exact reason what you're talking about. That sense, where, where even when you were going to talk, when you started talking about synthesis, there was this way where you went, you stopped and you went, and almost like you were both 
your thinking, but I also got the sense, at least my response to you, is I, I was also feeling with you. There's a, a sense, and sense is such a key word, right? Because sense in both connotates sensation, the givenness of my sensations, right? And feeling those sensations, but it also has it make sense, right? So it's this link between the, you know, the cognitive and the, and the physical. So when I have a sense of something, so in a certain way, you could say that one of the, the, the things that authentic relationship or the space of we um, is a place of sense, right? Mm -hmm. It's a place where we're not just pontificating and trying to talk over each other and, you know, victory over idea, but there's actual this awareness that we're both um, opening the way I make sense to the world in a vulnerable way, such mm -hmm. that I'm proactively willing to be changed in the process of opening to you, right? But it's a, a, it's a volunteer openness, voluntary openness, right? Um, that is, demonstrates a courage, mm -hmm. right? And, and so when, I, when, when the other person registers the impact, like that they say something that actually they can viscerally feel me, adjusting my worldview or adjusting how I'm seeing myself or you or my life making more sense to me through hearing what you just shared with me. What's interesting is that the other person has this incredible feeling of feeling heard, <laughs> of feeling seen, of feeling understood. So there's this link between me feeling seen, heard and understood um, through you being willing to be altered and affected by what I just said or the way I just was for you. And then with circling, we highlight that change live as that's happening as mm -hmm. an actual experience. And one of the things at the, at the end of that interview that I just thought was so gorgeous, is so, it was so gorgeous, where John was talking about where he grew up in a, like a religious fundamentalism. And, and he was talking about always being feeling like um, this, this power could reject him at any moment. And he was saying there's a danger in that though for me because that, that intense ideology that he lived inside of um, was also a kind of holding in which that gave him a personal narrative to live inside of. And that what, that he's, he, was, he was identifying the danger of falling into that with that sense of I that comes with that dogma. Mm -hmm. And what we ended up talking about was, and I really got a, a stronger sense in the conversation, it really impacted me, um, as I'm trying to articulate right now, through having heard him, right, is, and here's the inner subjectivity right here, this is what I'm talking about, is, is that the holding actually could be the process of mutual fittedness the process of, of the activity of constantly finding each other and adjusting each other and contributing to each other in proactive, vulnerable ways that lead to more stability. Mm -hmm. So, so, a, so a kind of almost a, an anti-fragile, it's almost an anti-fragile conversation. Yes, absolutely. It, it's absolutely. An, and, I, and I wonder just to, just to kind of ground it a little bit for people maybe who are watching, who are, who are not familiar with this at all. I, I would say, I mean, it, it's, it's really making the conversation self-aware in terms of, I mean, what I, I mean, I, I, I by no means call myself an expert, but I'm, but I'm very aware of how it feels to name the dynamics in a conversation or to once, once any, anything in, in any relationship even, once we've named the dynamics in the relationship, something lands and something becomes much more clear. And as soon as when that's not identified, there's an oddness, there's a, there's a sense of something's here, but I'm not entirely sure what it is. And as soon as that is named, it's like, well, actually, this is how I'm feeling, or this is what's present for me right now. Suddenly there is a landing. Yes. And uh, my, my mentor is a guy called Raffia Morgan, who has been doing a lot of this work since 
probably the 70s or the 80s. And he talks about everything registering in the field. Mm. That, that is, is a really beautiful way of looking at it. And it's absolutely true. Whatever is being thought that is not expressed is still present in the field. It's still present in the relationships between people. It's still present. If, if some things are expressed, say if we're in a, um, even a working environment, because we make this very much part of the process between myself and Ali in Rebel Wisdom, we're constantly in this process with each other of surfacing whatever dynamics are there, whatever is going on in sort of internally, because we know that if we don't do that, then, then things start to, the organization itself starts to develop a sort of lack of congruency or it develops an underbelly or like we've become very aware of that. And so when we're aware of something, we surface it and we go through this process with each other. And I think, right. and, and that's the same, I guess, in any relationship, like in any intimate relationship, I think this is such an important practice to, to learn. I'm, I'm curious for you when you talked about, so what I heard you say is, is that um, everything in the field registers. Mm. But there is something that you said that, uh, that just caught my interest is like, so when I name it, mm. what's, what is it about naming it that seems so crucial, so crucial such that you make sure to have it be a practice in what you're doing with your team? Mm. What, do you, what is it about naming it? In, like what, what happens to the field or what, what happens when you name it versus say if you didn't name it? What does naming it do? Yeah. This is, this is a very interesting inquiry. I, I connect it to something like this maybe as an analysis. I mean, how it feels is a relaxation. Mm. How it feels is a relaxation because part of me, I guess, was already aware that that was present. Right. And naming it is sort of like, ah, okay, that's what I was feeling. Right. Or that's what was there because it's, it's on the fringes of awareness, but, but then in the process of naming it, somehow it becomes concretized. It becomes part of, it becomes a, it's sort of, there's maybe something quite deep there about the shift between awareness and conceptual thought. Like there is, there is some kind of dynamic with us as meaning making animals who have this tool of language that is, somehow about concretizing thought that mm. means that when we concretize it it makes a shift mm. and that and there is some deep sort of theological thing as well i think i mean christianity sort of in the beginning was the word there is something i mean i i'm, I'm reaching here these are thoughts that i've had but maybe never expressed um there is something about like in some way i think we are intention life is intention incarnate it, it is intention mm. and words are intention mm. and so by ident and, and then the logos and the creative principle is identified with the word in some way so when we when we name things we're making them more real or there's there's some kind of shift mm. that happens mm. i can only i can only really explain it in a, from a felt sense perspective of something relaxes in the field yes just everyone knows their place. Everything is suddenly, it's like, ah, okay, that's what's going on. And there's an immense act of bravery often in doing that because usually the things that are in the field that are not being named are things that are difficult to name or things that are difficult to accept about oneself or difficult to, to name about some, someone else. Does that, that, that sort of, I mean, I feel, yeah, I, I, and I, I feel as well that sense of, slipping into and out of this sense of inquiry as well like i feel it in myself when i when i feel that that i'm i'm actually listening to myself talk and it and i'm i'm having i'm, I'm actually interested in what comes out there's a very definite difference there yes. between telling a story that i that i know quite well yes. this is quite a long digression but i think I, i'm interested in your thoughts well i i just well one when you said when you said god i these have just been thoughts that I've never put the language before. It, it, I, I felt very present to a distinctive space, like of, 
of whatever that space is of where, yeah, there's something on some level that I'm somehow in relationship to. I can, I can know that there's thoughts I've had, but when I come to terms with them, but I've never come to terms with them that like to come to terms with something, right. Mm-hmm. Is a really interesting way of, thinking about it. So I just noticed I was on the edge of my seat, (laughs) (laughs) but also felt a sense of space, a spaciousness in some way um, and a relaxation. Yeah. Uh, I think that the thing I'm aware of, well, I think one of the, one of the things I, 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 I want to look at, well, what is it, what is it that you're not doing when you name the thing? that's in the space that doesn't have a word for it, right? Um, I think a lot of times the, the reason I, I don't say what's there, um, that's whatever's in the field, whether it's a feeling or a thought or a hunch or I see something in somebody else that doesn't quite line up with me or something like that. Um, when I don't say it, it seems to me that what I'm actually doing on some level um, is I'm managing my own perception of myself in your head. So one of the th- cool things about circling and just kind of listening to it and doing it was re- really realizing how complex it is to be with another being. There is so much going on. And one of the things going on is, is being another for others, this sense of that on some level, I'm tracking who I think you think that I am. And that if I'm really, if I'm very identified with that you think of me a particular way, right? Then all of a sudden, whatever I say or don't say is gonna be about managing that. Mm. So a lot of times what I, I, I risk or the vulnerability that happens, right? Is, is it, is as I'm, I'm actually getting ready to say something that like actually to the degree that it's authentic is to the degree that I don't know what's going to happen next. Mm. Um, and I've noticed that it, it was like when somebody says, all right, you know, it, 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 people listening, it's like all those moments where you're like, all right, I'm going to be really honest here. And there's that aliveness that comes up in that fear and that anxiety. Basically what that means is I'm about ready. I'm now officially using speech not to control, but actually to relate. Meaning when I get done talking, I'm officially going to meet the unknown because I don't know what's going to happen next. And I especially don't know what you're going to think of me. Yeah. There's a link that just came up when you were talking about the stronger one's identity is, the harder it is to enter into this space. And I think there's a, there's a link here with, so we, we've covered the, the IDW, the intellectual dark web. Um, and the excitement at the beginning was this sense of kind of intellectual exploration and maybe people changing their minds. And my, my sense is if you've really established yourself as a, as a name, like this intellectual exploration where you're really sort of allowing yourself to be changed by what other people are saying is much harder to do because Mm. if you've established yourself as with a certain position, if you've got any kind of public profile, I think in particular, it's very, very hard to enter into this kind of dialogue. Yes. And And it's very hard anyway, just to enter into this kind of dialogue in, in public full stop. Mm -hmm. And also I know one of the people we have on the channel, um, Jordan Greenhall talks about this quite a lot, how in a world of zero sum games and rivalrous dynamics, if you show up with this kind of openness and this kind of attitude and someone else shows up with a, I want to beat you in a debate, I want to prove that I'm right, then you're the sucker in that, in that frame, in a way. Or you would be seen as the sucker in that frame because this is in, inherently a sort of generative way of, of, of communicating and there's a, there's a huge level of intimacy and a level of trust. Mm-hmm. And it's very hard to have that level of intimacy and trust in the public sphere. Um, 
because there isn't that kind of psychological safety a lot of the time, especially if what we're actually going to be talking about is a, is a, any kind of a charged topic where people are really identified with certain perspectives. I really appreciate what you're saying I, a lot. Um, yeah, because to, be to be a public figure, especially at this particular time, I don't even think we've been in a time like this. I don't think we have a time where there's we, such that we have a history for. So it's really hard to even understand at all what's going on, right? But to be a public thinker today, I, you know, I have to say that I would say I've been very impressed with Jordan Peterson in the way he's encountered it, right? Um, and what I've basically heard him, the way I think I've seen him encounter it is he's not responding to the, um, the downstream in, innuendos or intentions of the interviewer. He's just, when somebody, when he kind of gets somebody who's trying to corner him, he just will just stay right where he is and he'll just bring it back into what's unarguable, right? No, that's not what I'm saying. And he's been, done a great job at like being uh, like sovereign in that way, impressively so. I mean, I'm like, God, I don't, <laughs> what it takes to do that at the level he's doing that, especially understanding his temperament, right? His compassionate and more it can be agreeable. Like I just kudos for him. Mm. The, the opportunity I've seen, I've often thought in interviews, another possibility in that would be to actually shift the level of the logical level of the conversation. Right, which what would happen if we just actually name the dynamic that's going on, mm. you know, and we just went to a different level of un unarguableness. It's like it's like whoa, hang on a second. I showed up thinking that you're genuinely wanting to know what I was saying. However, it seems to me that um, I'm being painted into a corner. At least how I'm perceiving that is that like is that what's happening? Am I wrong? Like what? Like yeah. That's so where do you want me to go? And just moving the level of the conversation down and staying to the level of unarguableness in the dynamic. Or, or name, naming the game that has been pl being played as it's being played. Yes, totally. Yeah, it's interesting it's because that, that's something that Jordan Peterson, you know the famous interview you had with Kathy Newman? Yes, yes. He actually, after that, so there was the famous moment where he said, where she asked him uh, about freedom of speech. And he said, well, you have to have the freedom to offend. Otherwise, you don't have the freedom to think. And as a journalist, you should know this. And she was lost for words. And he said, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, to his credit, he, he, he said, I shouldn't have said gotcha. Mm -hmm. I should have used that moment uh, to say, OK, can we have a real conversation? You've been playing this role. I've been playing this role. Can we actually now have a conversation? Which I think what you're, what you're saying. Yeah, and that little moment, that little moment, you're right, was a window where she was actually vulnerable. Actually, I'll, I'll make a distinction there. I don't think she was vulnerable. I think she was exposed. There was an, oppor and there was an opportunity to invite vulnerability. And for me, there's a big difference between being exposed and, and being vulnerable. Exposure has that element of like, you know, what usually why people are so scared of being vulnerable because it's usually they associate it with, you know, your pants being like pulled down at, you know, recess and everyone laughing at you. It's got this element of it's happened to me and I'm suddenly exposed to the elements. Vulnerability seems to be a volunteerness. It's like it takes a certain kind of courage where I'm really aware of a risk that I'm taking and I'm choosing to take it. It's so a I, surrender. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's a surrender. And this is why this is the important part. It's a surrender that although I'm vulnerable, because I'm doing it voluntarily, whatever happens after that, right, will have be much more likely to be strengthening instability, like being bringing one more into stability. Mm. Right. And so I would say that following what's most alive, right, is identifying those moments where, where you feel a, a felt sense of like, oh, whatever's right here right now, if I stepped into it, I'm now stepping beyond my, my own frame, right? In a way that I don't know what's gonna happen next. However, to do so really takes a choice and a sense of sovereignty. 
-hmm. And so that sense of sovereignty goes to communion and communion, right, then deepens your sovereignty that which goes to communion. And you have those, that cycle happening. And you could say that circling or intersubjective practices are all about enacting that and becoming better and better and better and better and more practiced at um, being that way. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, to pick up, you mentioned Jordan Peterson, and also you mentioned something similar in the conversation with John Bavaki, and I think there's, there's a similarity in the way that they both show up as, as lecturers. There's an aliveness to the way that they are. I felt that with Jordan Peterson before, and you reflected that to John in your conversation with him, that even when they're lecturing, uh, which is effectively a monologue, um, there's a sense of there's something very alive about the way they, they do that. It's not telling a story. There is almost a kind of inquiry there. They know where the pieces are. They know what the landscape is, but they're exploring it in real time. Yes. And I think that almost more than anything else is mm -hmm. what has attracted a lot of people to their thought mm -hmm. is that sense of there's such a different quality to a, to a conversation that's being genuinely extemporaneously created there's an aliveness to it to compared to like ac academia is is largely dead it's sort of people recycling dead ideas or dead concepts and there's there's very little emergent about it but there is something very emergent about john and mm -hmm. and and jordan i wonder if, if if it's still the same with jordan because he's been touring the same material for so long sort of over a year doing 12 rules for life mm -hmm. but with john there's this real sense of and he's such an embodied thinker as well you watch him he he's he's constantly gesticulating there's this sort of um neat what comes to mind is nietzsche's uh, phrase i think with a hammer yes like it, it's a it's a kind of deep embodied um right. knowledge um right. That, that, right. that, yeah, that I think really comes back to this same sense of yes. intersubjective, yeah, intersubjective dialogue of just being, being, trying to be on that sort of edge of what wants to emerge and being surprised by it. Yes, absolutely. That's, I think, I think I would say that that's what, I think when people talk about what they like about Jordan Peterson, right, for example, um, I don't know if it's the, what they say, the content that they say. I think one of the things that they, they like the experience of, he, of listening to him because both John and, um, and Jordan, you're right. They have this quality of that to understand what they're saying, you must actually think the thought that they're thinking. And, and because they're right at the, at, on a, just at the, they're just always, like trying to speak what's just beyond the horizon, right? And you almost have to allow yourself to be changed by it. Yes, 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 yes. You open up and you have to, there's, it leaves your, your it, and what's interesting about listening is what's interesting is I can't think and listen at the same time, right? I can feel and listen at the same time, right? I can kind of look and listen at the same time. But, I, but if I think while I'm trying to listen, I can't. There's a very wedded like relationship between listening and thinking. So to really um, to listen to them is to actually think the thoughts that they're thinking in the moment, right? Which are are still being worked out, right? So the, so people when they listen to them, they don't. It's not like they just got a bunch of information. They went through an experience. Um, and I really love this about what you guys are doing. And w one of the things I like about um, one of the rare places where technology just doesn't lead to more optimization, it actually creates a place such that you can have a very untechnological experience called deep, meandering, difficult conversations to grapple with them. Um, and I, I I like that we're talking about this because this is a real, I don't think there's a whole lot of language that articulates this particular thing that we're talking about. Um, 
but it can be very, very, very transformative in that sense. So there's like a few different levels. Like on one level, they're, they're, they're teaching you the things that they're talking about, but they're also teaching you how to think. How? By understanding what they're talking about, you start to actually have to step on the presuppositions that they're stepping on to then think the thoughts that they're thinking. And I think that that's why we want to go, there's certain videos you want to go back and listen to over and over and over again. It's because you, you have this sense that um, there's a thought here that I don't have the correct presuppositions to be able to think all the way, right? So like I, I, I rehearse it, I rehearse it, I rehearse it. And at some point I get the background, right? Mm. That is required to like give the foreground thought. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling as well a link back to what we were discussing before, which is naming what's in the field. Yeah. Because, I mean, Jordan says this, that a lot of people come up to him and say, you're saying what I already knew. Right, right. And I think John is doing a very similar grand narrative. And if a grand narrative is true, and Jordan also really links this to evolutionary history and the fact that these stories are so old that they're actually encoded into us there is a sense of they're doing what the process i described before that we're actually sort of speaking making conscious what was implicit and making conscious what was there in the field is basically what they're doing yes. in a much more in almost this sort of vast cultural level yeah yeah it's genuine philosophy i would say it's like I think Nietzsche talked about. It. He's like the philosopher. The philosopher doesn't have an original thought out of nothing. They're just the first ones to bring into articulated thought what has been emerging in the culture as they bring in the language, right? And and Nietzsche did this profoundly, right? And I think which, which I, makes it an art, which makes it an art in some ways. I mean, that is that's the essence of the artist, isn't it? To sort of yeah sense what is coming before it sense making right mm -hmm. like it really is that i, I there's something about it. i really like the, the way that you guys are talking about sense making as a thing that i'm hearing other people use because something about that word that gathers the appropriate term for the the transformational activity we're knowing we're we're knowing um one knows through being transformed by what one knows right, that activity, and there's one way it could happen is like what we're talking about with John and Jordan and other people. Man, when they're, gra when they're being existentially confronted, right, you end up being confronted with them if you really listen, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other thing I appreciated about talking with John in that interview was The, this connection that we that emerged in the conversation of because for for for, for Vakey, he talked about being socially phobic right so man, that's where it's like on on some level jordan peterson i'll get the sense that he's socially phobic right he's like loves people and you know john's a little bit more like uh, it, it's like a little bit more introverted or something so there's this other level of terror for him to be to have people know more about him than he, then he knows about them is a very, can feel very exposing. But what he said was really interesting is that it's of the pe different people he's, he's been talking to, like Jordan Peterson, right? Like, like Peggio, like the, uh, who's the Christian guy um, with the white Paul beard? Paul Van Yeah, he's awesome. Hmm. And he was even saying with Paul, like um, one of the kind of insights that we had together as we were talking was, on some level, out of all the people he's talked to, he probably, they have very different, like they, 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 they veer from each other's views more than anybody. But in some ways, because uh, the demonstration of risk that Paul is demonstrating in doing what he's doing, right, has um, allowed, allowed uh, uh, John the courage to transcend his own phobia, right? Mm -hmm. And that's that link between, that's that, uh, that link where, that, that's where it gets very heroic in that way, right? And that other people are demonstrating 
coming forward and being vulnerable proactively, right, in the face of, of the risk. And, and it draws other people, even socially phobic people, out of the, out of the woodwork. Mm. That kind of vulnerability, I think, is maybe one of the antidotes to some of the things that you've, you've been confronting in, in your channel, like some of the pol polarization and in, in, in culture wars. So there's something about that that like, I think we can see live as you're making self-aware of that emergent is that you're actually, you could say on one level, you're, you're interviewing people that are demonstrating like proactive, vulnerable courage mm. in a way that's making them stronger. Yeah. And I, I think there's a real hunger for that, yeah. for people to, to see people doing that. Yeah, absolutely. In mm. fact, I, I, the video that you sent me, Mm. Um, that, mm. Is this the three-way conversation yeah. between, yeah, yeah I, I was interested to, to, to raise that. So this is a three-way conversation between Jamie Wheel, Jordan Greenhall, and Daniel Schmachtenberger, which we will probably be making live on the channel fairly soon. Um, but, I, but I think it's one of the most, it's about emergent sense-making. It's kind of, that's the, the topic of it, just framing it for anyone watching. What when I when I said about that video went hmm. I just curious that hmm. Like I just felt the hmm. Well, it was interesting because I already had in my mind that I wanted to. That was going to be sort of my next question mm -hmm. was to to say what about that that film? Yeah, I just did that that, that when somebody says hmm hmm, I just noticed. I always joke, it's like, if you want to know how to circle, just like go into a room, somebody says something, and somebody goes, hmm, go, could you put that in another way? And as they're talking, somebody else is going, hmm, put that another way. And eventually, if you keep doing that, eventually you'll hit God, right? <laughs> that there's something about that, hmm, uh, that I think is very, I mean, I'm just curious what you think about this, is like, feels like that, that speaks to a sensibility, hmm. When somebody says that, it registers at a, a, both a change and a knowingness, and something got unconcealed. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think I probably do that quite a lot. It might be a little bit of a, a verbal tick of mine. Totally. Totally. In fact, I know I do because I have to keep editing out the ums at the end of the when I, when I'm doing my my editing. I pretty much do that at the end of every time the person speaks. So I know that that's something that's, I'm sure it's not unique to me, but it's certainly something I do quite a lot. Yes. So there's like the space filler, mm's, right? But then there's like, hmm. And I think one of the things that registers is how the ideal or the, the idea are actually very connected to our bodies and sense making. And so when somebody's impacted, I've just always noticed like in circling, it's like how I know where to bring my attention is when somebody, mm, I was like, oh, something just emerged. And then they have, they come to language with something, but they actually have to look to describe it. It's both intellectual, ideological, right? And sensory at the same time. I'm just really fascinated by that. that mm. mm -hmm. the, the thing about that conversation, which I just thought was so good. <laughs> It, it was so good. And on so many different levels, right? There's the level of like the ideas that they talked about, right? Um, and how those, those ideas got more distinguished and developed as it went on, right? So there's, there's tons we could, we could talk about in, in terms of, of, of that. However, there was the, the part that was like one of the highlights for me was when, um, Greenhall called out the topography of the conversation. Remember that part? Yes. And it's really interesting because it's like, um, that, was, that was kind of bugging me for about 20 minutes. <laughs> As I was sitting there, I was like, huh, they are both talking to him. Why are they talking to him? And then he kept bringing out more of like, basically what I'm hearing you say, like uh, uh, the guy in the middle, what was his name? Uh, again, that was Jamie, Jamie Wheel. 
he was kind of that. It was really interesting to watch that typography move in the conversation, right? Um, because he kind of was presenting a lot of the stuff. He was basically saying like presenting stuff about, yeah, but there's this ra reality on the ground. What about dun, 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 and how do we, and for me, that's when it started to go towards him, right? Like the, 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 you know, everybody started talking to him. And then, and then Green, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm dyslexic. I'm terrible with remembering names. Um, the the uh, Green, Green? Yeah, Green, Green Hall, Jordan Green Hall, or, Green. or Jordan Hall. He's changed his name, which makes it even, even harder. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so we'll call him we'll call Jordan Greenhall. When he says, oh, I want to call something out. There's a topography. Um, and then he did this other thing. Uh, like this, is, he is so, he is so, like, I don't know. He, he's got a, an intelligence that is, uh, I've never quite, don't know if I've ever experienced any, in a kind of intelligence that I've ever experienced. There's really something. I'm still, I don't know what I'm looking at when I'm looking at him. Um, but there's this way in where he called out the typography, but then he went to this other move, right? And he was like, I think rather than focusing on it back on Jamie, he focused it, and what's the name, name of the other guy, the other triangle? Yeah, Daniel. Daniel. It's like, actually, I haven't heard anything from you. And he just, just the awareness of that we're having an experience together and there's a way that it's going. Um, it disrupted things, right? But in such a way that actually for me, the main takeaway I got from that, like for me in terms of content, was this thing about um, urgency. What, what, what Greenhall said, because it's it just like this, this sense of urgency and what Greenhall said was, yeah, real or imagined urgency, right, is not to respond to it as in an urgent way, right, is to not sacrifice the way we are with what we're being with, the way of being, even when it's a real urgency. And he used the analogy, John Bond, you know, uh, James Bond, right, being like, you know, the world's going to fall apart and James is just kind of like, oh, like as if he's stirring his martini. And it's, what's, what's wild about that is that I, I started to notice that that topography started to happen when the sense of urgency was kept being brought up, right? Is when James was like, well, what about da 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 da? And like, he, he kept presupposing the reality on the ground and like, well, how are we gonna do this? And he asked the how question. And that's when that topography was, was like started and then was named and when they named it, right? And for me anyways, the birth of that conversation was like, oh yeah, I can see all these places in my life where it looks urgent and I, I almost get, get dopamine out of <laughs> sacrificing a way of being in responding to the urgency. And I just, is one of those ones that was an insight that I could just frame all, all through my history and my whole life. And, and that that was part of naming what was happening in like in the field, in the inner subjectivity. So that was my clumsy way of trying to like uh, uh, circle, circumambulate around all the different multiple levels in which that conversation was deeply intelligent for me. Mm. Yeah, I, I think there were, I think you're right. I mean, that, that, was, that was a moment where it became more self-aware in in observing with in observing what was going on while it was going on which then encouraged a deeper level of presence in everyone there yeah and yeah. and i thought the just there were so many gems in that conversation so many different analogies i love the quaker example of don't speak until spoken through mm -hmm. was fantastic uh, I, I love the analogies with jazz as well. Right. Just the sense of being alive to what wants to emerge. And then we have 
and jazz i think john also mentioned jazz in your conversation with him because there is or let, let's not link it to jazz let's talk about any any band right we're aware in any band it's like when someone wants to go on a solo or when when someone's kind of cutting someone else and it's like you're biting my jam or whatever it we we have a terminology for it and we all know or certainly the members of a band know when someone is playing from that place of real alignment and when they're kind of spoiling yeah. someone else's or they're or they're they're overwriting someone else's contribution and that there's a whole implicit knowledge that that we don't really have as much in conversation or in dialogue yes and there's a way as you're talking i really appreciate the way that you just kind of brought that back into like oh yeah jazz and and no not just jazz all music and that we know, there is a sense that we know when somebody's riffing in a way that's really gorgeous and when somebody's riffing out of i even think in the conversation you talked about like some sense of narcissism or needing to be seen or something like that right yeah there is a way that and... i really enjoyed the way the way that green hall named it right because I, I got this sense of i even felt this as you were saying it I, I felt this like a little tension like something's about to happen in the way the what what he pointed to wasn't per, like to anybody personal because he we could have gone the route of well like what's in jamie's psychology right <laughs> what's in what's going on there like but he went to there, there's something we're inside of. There's this that's happening as a dynamic and looking at it as a systems sense of it, right? Where it didn't, it, 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 uh, it felt like it, it allowed, it transcended the personality basically, right? And it, and yet it invited everybody to to see themselves in the dynamic that was happening, but it spoke to something that was transcendent and influencing the, the we, if you will, which led to something in my, in my view that then it started to articulate. They all started to relax a lot more and it started to get more jazzy, right? At the, at the end of it. It was just, I really think it was a beautiful conversation. And I think that there's, one of the th one of the things that I was how I was listening to it because one of my deep interests is with circling is beyond just people's personal growth. That wh how is it that we can have dialogues and conversations even when it's not about something personal, right? That like how can ideas be expressed right and such that 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 can have this um auto poetic self of of where we're co-fitting each other and opening and being vulnerable not having to even talk about ourselves at all but be able to talk about ideas right and yeah. such walk away more ourselves and enrich than we, than we walked in so i think there's a lot of different levels of intelligibility that um we could we could draw out of that conversation. So I really appreciate the that you were inclined to do it. Mm. Yeah, when I knew that the three of them were going to be in the same place, I kind of knew that it was it was something that we had to to get on camera. I wanted to to just make one last link, which is this linking between what we're talking about in terms of a kind of interpersonal, intersubjective dialogue and the sort of the systems change and the um societal cultural piece which which is something that jordan and daniel and jamie as well are, are really bringing the sense of the collective intelligence is something that we're in desperate need of as a next evolutionary step yeah and what and that's sort of the the piece of the synthesis that I, I'm really yeah. profoundly like that. I, I, I just, I just love the way that these deep systems thinkers and real cutting edge intellects have all arrived in this same place that 
maybe you and I know quite implicitly through our mm -hmm. counseling and, and personal growth experiences of, which is a sense that I had when I first started really doing this work. It's like, wow, this, this is actually a modality that is, mm -hmm. is essential for us all to, to move into this, this ability to, to be generative beyond the ego as much as we can, or at least when there is egotistical stuff, we can call it out and then hopefully encourage ourselves into a deeper level of connection to, to have them saying, which is something I also feel fundamentally to be true. This is now existentially important for us as a species and is probably the generator function to use Daniel's language. It's the, it's the generator for the new system that we all feel needs to to come like this sort of sense of a paradigm shift that many people have spoken about for many years but we're all seeing this this sense of cultural breakdown or cultural uh stress and what's required is a new system based on honesty based on non-rivalry based on these kind of relationships that are not zero sum they're based on trust they're based on vulnerability Obviously, it's a very fragile thing in a world, and they use the language of sort of game A and game B to, to talk about this. Right. But it, it then links it all back together in a way that I find really pleasing yes. aesthetically, I guess. Yeah, yeah. What, I'm just curious, that, that, I, I wasn't expecting you to say that, like pleasing you aesthetically, something about that seems important like that I, may, maybe what we're saying is that it pleases you aesthetically that there's something beautiful about yes the way that we're talking about it i'm one i think if i look at the gravity that i felt in that like and as i sit with like the kind of gravities i get from oh yeah it's because there is a way in which i feel yeah it's there's there's something beautiful about the way that we're listening to this um, and sensing it. And that maybe, I, I'm just wondering, maybe that sense of the, the sense of beauty that shines forth from the inquiry and the way that we're, we're, we're talking about it. I wonder if that's an indication of that we're, maybe we're at the right spot. Hmm. I'm thinking about. Well, or, or try, yeah, I, I, I'd, I had a sense of direction to that. I wouldn't. Yeah, I, I don't like the I don't like that analogy of the right spot, because I think there's a sense of a, um, there's a sense of movement. I mean, the aesthetic that that felt right in the moment. I think it's it's true. But there's also something that I think a lot of a lot of people are picking up from the, the people who are who are following what we're doing and immediately recognize it and are like yes i can see what you guys are doing even though we can't really name it there's a sense of i can see where you guys are going i can see where you're yeah and, and there's a sense of evolution there's a sense of a teleology that i think a lot of people are picking up to this conversation yes. um yes. so it, and it's right and there's a rec there's a recognition there's a deep recognition and i think that is an aesthetic sense of ah, i see i mean none of us know where the destination is or what the, the we know there's a there there but we don't know what where there is yet mm -hmm. and as soon as we start thinking we do know where the there is then we're no longer right that's when the the journey ends in some way right because we have to keep alive to, to, and, and make that making sense prematurely of, okay, it's this thing is, is, is the trap. And I think a lot of people have actually, I don't want to name names, but I think a lot of people who've been on this emerging current have crystallized around a certain perspective. And then once you're crystallized around that, you're then dragged down into a sort of, into a, a more sort of polarized, fixated position that you're then having to defend rather than stay open. Right. Right. So there's a, I've, uh, so that, <laughs> I experienced beauty as you were talking. 
like the way that you're bringing that together. I think it's, and you said something about, yeah, spot, the right, we're right at the right spot isn't quite the right word. Because what I heard you say is yeah, basically- Yeah, because I think there has to be a sense of movement. Yes. Like I feel a sense of movement rather than in the right spot. It's like we're, I wonder if there's an analogy. Yeah, it's like surf, surfing a wave, I guess, or um, I think Jamie has used an analogy that, that works. I can't really remember what it is at the moment, but it's- yeah, it's it's not fixated in a position, and it's, it's, it's kind of like an ecstatic temporality in a sense, in the in the Heideggerian sense of the word. I think that awareness of of so I, I made a video one time just to try to get this notion of a horizon. I think it's a horizon that we're talking about, right? Of that that the ground, right? There's chaos on the ground. Yet as I look up on the horizon and I see more of the issues that give the ground, right? As I keep looking at the horizon, what has me look at the, the horizon is the sense that there's something beyond it. By definition, a horizon is something you can't ever reach, but you can move towards. And by the time you get to it, you see more of what, it, what, it, what was concealed. So that sense of reve revel reveal, which is an interesting word. Um, the, Greek, the, the original notion of truth is aletheia, right? Truth as the event of unconcealedness. That, and this is what I'm kind of feeling is beautiful about the space of the conversation is, for me, is that genuine sense of revealing where, where it's, you could both veil, it both means to reveil and to unveil at the same time. And there's a sensibility that they're the same word. And there's something about that, what it seems to take to, 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 to be with what's emerging um, is a sense of one, recognizing a preciousness that's worthy of veiling, right? And that, and that there's ways that you can reveal but conceal it at the same time. And thus you can't name it and make it a noun and then become identified with it. And so what I'm hearing is you're just really self-aware, that's part of the self-awareness of it, if I'm hearing you right, is yeah, it's really important that we, that, that we not, we, we be aware that it's unnameable in some way. Because mm. at the moment we name it, I put a shell around myself is the moment I become brittle. Mm. So there's something about this strength, vulnerability, opening to novelty, in such a way that deepens my sense of security. Yeah. It rises out of my grappling with, or with Heidegger. Mm. So it's like, it's, uh, it's, it's more like a, it's like a, a phenomenology, permunetic phenomenology, permunetic existential phenomenology, basically. Who, was it Heidegger who talked about the throneness? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I was really struck by that. Yep. Heidegger yeah. is one of those ones that just like, I didn't even know how by grappling with Heidegger for the first three years that we started circling, I had no idea what the connections was until I kind of, I started realizing it after the fact of how it transformed how I was seeing the world. Because mm. that's the thing about Heidegger in phenomenology is he would say that Uh, that that the greatest mystery isn't so much beyond the horizon as that which is most near. It's concealed in our nearness. So lots of, so that, and that's what I think, I, what I realize is circling is so much about is like, what's here? Like mm -hmm. what's already always having found myself already begun and I'm inside of it. Mm -hmm. Just reading Heidegger over and over and over again of him doing that, not understanding what the fuck he was talking about. All of a sudden I was like, I look around and I watch my scene go, doot, 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 doot. I'm like, ah, that little motherfucking German motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> he's, got, he's got into your head. He got me, yes. Guy, this has been a really wonderful conversation. I think the, I'm, I'm really sensing the quality of listening and inquiry that you're, you're bringing to it, which has been, yeah, I've, I, I felt myself kind of going into new territory just because of the quality of the listening and, and presence that you've brought. So thank you very much for, for that. 
thank you received over here deeply and i'm sure we will do it again sometime absolutely rebel wisdom is a new sense-making platform bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world if you're enjoying our content then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber which will give you access to a load of exclusive films also you can then join our group zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.